Oh my gosh, I think he's won every award that you can get, and now they've made him the judge of the decade. Uh, so. We also have with us Professor David Dulio, who is now on a speaking tour through Oakland County and into Macomb on this very topic, and he is also the chair, president, head honcho over at the Oakland University Center for Civic Engagement. If you haven't found their page on Facebook yet, please look at it, because the great thing that David's doing there is he's making sure that it is, I want to say nonpartisan. It, it's by, it's trying to bring in both sides of the question, and he's been doing a great job bringing in a variety of different issues, and if we're going to win in 2020, we have to know what our opponents are saying. We have to know, understand their position, so it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about the different issues. And so both of these gentlemen are going to be speaking to us this evening. The first one is going to be uh, Judge Michael Warren. And the way we're going to do questions for this evening, remember I told you, you can't ask questions unless you have a microphone in your face. Um, we're going to let both of the gentlemen go through their presentation. And then after they're both finished, then we will do questions uh, so that we can uh, gauge the time. And I will be watching to make sure that we, we keep them at a reasonable hour. So breakfast will be served at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> And we can get to questions and answer at lunchtime. Um, with that, I will turn the microphone over to Judge Michael Warren. No. Good evening. Uh, I am Judge Michael Warren. Sometimes you get this question. I'm an Oakland County Circuit Court Judge, and I'm a former member of the State Board of Education. I, first off, I want to say now that I've heard who you all are, I'm very impressed and a little nervous that I will not uh, meet your expectations, so I will try my best to do that. A couple of quick commercials. Uh, first, if you care about the future of our country, whoa, got really loud there. Care about the future of our country, um, and you are concerned about the fact that we don't seem to understand our history and our civics, which poses a great threat to our survival as a free people. Uh, I have a wonderful post-Christmas gift that you can buy for your friends and family. It's a book that I've written called America's Survival Guide, How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by reclaiming our founding first principles in history. And as was mentioned earlier, um, I am the co-creator of Patriot Week, which is founded when my then 10-year-old daughter pounded on the table and demanded a new celebration for America. It goes from September 11th, which is what you know what that is, and ends on September 17th. Can anybody tell me what September 17th is? You don't need a microphone for this. Uh, the signing of the Constitution. Signing the Constitution. Tyler said it first, but Fantastic, uh, so loud, but um, <laughs> that's why we love it. Uh, so we have those anchor dates. Each day we celebrate a day. We celebrate founding first principle from a declaration of independence, key documents and speeches, founding fathers and other great patriots, and flags from our history. There are some new faces here that maybe have never heard of Patriot Week, so I have brochures, I have books for sale, only $15 with a free autograph, and an email list for those of you that are, might be interested in Patriot Week. That's the commercial, and now I'm going to go to impeachment. I like to start, I know this is crazy. This is insane. This is never heard of, it is never done. I'm going to start at the beginning with the actual text of the Constitution. <laughs> Article 1, Section 2 says, The House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment. House of Representatives, sole power of impeachment. Article 1, Section 3 says, the Senate should have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside. And no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Um, just take a little bit take a step back. I think because you're all engaged and are here, you probably understand this, but I think there's a great misconception about this. People, some people think, oh, the president's been impeached, and they are automatically, he's kicked out of office. Absolutely untrue. You're impeached, and then you stand trial. You only need a majority of the House to impeach you. But you need two-thirds of the Senate to convict you. When there's that trial, and um, actually it doesn't say trial, it says to try all impeachments, 
So there's a great ambiguity about what that means. The, um, and what that means, really, is that the Senate gets to decide what the rules are. Okay? The Senate is supposed to try the case under oath and affirmation. And in 1868, for the trial of President Andrew Johnson, they have an oath, which all senators is the same oath that, um, assuming we proceed to trial with President Trump, will be used then. And it was also used uh, in connection with uh, Bill Clinton. It's to do impartial justice according to the Constitution and the laws. That is the quote, or, or the oath that they have to take. When it's the president being tried, the chief justice will preside. Um, there are other officials can be impeached, and when that happens, it's just the normal, uh, regular business that happens in connection with how you conduct the Senate. But when they have the president, they yank in the chief justice. What exactly the Chief Justice powers are, again, kind of is ambigu ambiguous. It doesn't say what that means. Now, when I preside over a trial, I have to follow certain rules. The Michigan Rules of Procedure, the Michigan Rules of Evidence, the substantive law I have to follow. Uh, I, I, we, usually, we select a jury. Uh, the jury's under their own oath, and there's this kind of bifurcation, a separation of powers in the courtroom, I'm the law, the jury is the facts. They figure out whether or not a crime was committed or if a defendant is criminal, is, excuse me, civilly liable based on the substantive law, but I rule on procedures and process and what evidence comes in and those kinds of things. Presumably, if the Senate agrees on what the rules are, all the Chief Justice will do is make sure that those rules are followed, um, but an interesting twist on this is if he makes a ruling that the majority of the Senate disagrees with, they probably can overrule him. So that, that's interesting. Um, and again, you need two-thirds of the senators to um, convict. Article 2, Section 4 says, the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. It's pretty limited. Um, treason is a crime that is actually defined in the Constitution. It requires two witnesses to convict someone of treason. Um, it's the, you know, in the political world, it's the worst possible crime that you can commit. Bribery. Uh, you know, generally means that you are taking money or giving money to someone for to it, to make them do something. Uh, and in this context, it would almost certainly be political, but not necessarily. And then there's this thing, high crimes and misdemeanors, and that is a, termino a set of terminology that comes over from England, and I'll explain what that means a little bit more in a minute. But first, I want to go back to why we have impeachment. Now, James Madison is considered the father of the Constitution. His short little guy, he talked like this, kind of the opposite of Van Tassel. And, um, but he was brilliant, brilliant person. And I, I'm sorry, I wanted to say one thing about Jim Tyler that I forgot, which is that he's on the Patriot Week Foundation Advisory Board and really helped a lot in the legislature in connection with Patriot Week, so thank you. All right, back to Madison. He reminds me of Madison, you know, can you can't. So, social studies teacher, right? So, really. Um, Madison uh, had a great deal to do with framing our Constitution. He was also the smartest man at the convention because he took the minutes. He wrote down his own notes, not really the official minutes, his own notes, and transcribed what people were uh, arguing over. And his minutes, in effect, uh, or, or notes, define much of what we know about the framers' intent. And so sometimes he'll quote directly, sometimes he'll paraphrase, so this is his style. He's quoting um, Colonel Mason, and Mason was from Virginia, a fellow Virginian, who um, was also very instrumental in the framing of the Constitution, but ended up opposing it because it did not have a Bill of Rights. And he was very concerned that there was no Bill of Rights, and he wrote the Bill of Rights for Virginia and said, it was really important that we had a Bill of Rights in Virginia, and it's just as important that we have it in the federal government. So he ended up opposing and then, the, of course, Madison conceded and made a promise that if you ratify the thing, then we'll add the Bill of Rights, and that's what happened. So he's quoting Mason here. No point 
is of more importance than the right of impeachment should be continued. Shall any man be above justice? Above all that shall be man above it, who can commit the most extensive injustice? When great crimes were committed, he was for punishing the principal as well as the co-adjudicators. So he, he says no one is above the law. Madison himself, <coughs> paraphrasing himself, wrote this. Thought it indispensable that some provision should be made for the defending the community against the incapacity, negligence, or perfidy of the chief magistrate. Uh, we didn't have a 12th Amendment and some other amendments that later that come out about the vice presidency. So he was like, hmm, what if somebody has a heart attack or has a, well, they didn't know probably what a stroke was, but were incapacitated and couldn't fulfill their duties. We got to kick them out. And so impeachment was a way to kick them out. Or negligence or perfidy, in other words, doing bad things. The limitation of that period of his service was not a sufficient security. So the fact that there was a term limit didn't matter. He might lose his capacity after his appointment. He might pervert his administration into a scheme of peculation or oppression. He might betray his trust to foreign powers. In the case of the executive magistrate, which was to be administered by a single man, loss of capacity or corruption was more within the compass of probable events, and either of them might be fatal to the republic. <coughs> Anyone that thinks the founding fathers are just some dead old white men that his opinions don't count are blind to how superior and genius the genius that they had, because they're talking about stuff that we're talking about right now, right? This, if you believe the Democrats, Madison is talking exactly about what the Democrats are, are alleging, right? Free training, trust of foreign powers, corruption of a, of, a, of a man. But Alexander Hamilton, another genius, wrote this in Federalist Number 65 as a cautionary note to really cut to the, to the chase here. He said, a well-constituted court for the trial of impeachments is an object not more to be desired than difficult to be obtained in a government wholly elective. The subjects of its jurisdiction are those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. They are of a nature which may with peculiar propriety be denominated political, and political in all caps as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. The prosecution of them, for this reason, will seldom fail to agitate the passions of the whole community and to divide it into parties, more or less friendly or inimical to the accused. In many cases, it will connect itself with the pre-existing factions and will list all of their animosities, partialities, influence, and interest on one side or on the other. And in such cases, there will always be the greatest danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of parties than by the real demonstrations of innocence or guilt. So even before the Constitution was adopted, Hamilton's got the red flag saying, this is going to be a very political process. When you go down this road, parties are going to divide, and you're going to have this huge fight that's driven by politics. It's interesting that he wrote this because at the time, the one kind of blind spot the founders had was about political parties. They did not envision that there would actually be organized political parties. Why that is, I can't figure it out because England had them for, for generations, but they said, ah, you know, it's not going to happen in America. Ah, Hamilton started one of the political parties once he was in office, okay? So it didn't, it didn't uh, last very long, this kind of this utopian idea of elder statesmen running the country. But even thinking that, he thought that they would divide themselves into political parties or into political disputes. So the question is, what, one of the questions is, what's a high crime and misdemeanor? Because it seems that seems like a legal term. And you come into my court and I say you have a high misdemeanor, that means it's a two-year misdemeanor. And I really don't have high felonies. I have capital offenses and felonies, and you know, we could get into that. But they meant something entirely different than what no, you normally would think of. Joseph Story was a Supreme Court justice. He was not of the first generation. He was like whoever, who's like the youngest person in this room now, the, the, there's a 20 year old, hopefully 25 year old, uh, of the founding generation. Very young person, grew up kind of in, in the wake of the, of the founding and knew 
he was a tremendous legal scholar, knew what they were all thinking, and, and he wrote this. What are impeachable offenses? They are treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. For the definition of treason, resort may be had in the Constitution itself, but for the definition of bribery, resort is naturally necessary to the common law. Now, neither the Constitution nor any statute of the United States has in any manner defined any crimes, except treason and bribery, to be high crimes and misdemeanors, and as such, impeachable. It will not be sufficient to say that in these cases, where an offense is punishable by any state statute of the United States, it, it may and ought to be deemed an impeachable offense. It is not every offense that by the Constitution is so impeachable. It must not only be an offense, but a high crime and misdemeanor. Again, there are many offenses purely political, which have been held to be within the reach of parliamentary impeachments, not one of which is the slightest manner alluded to in our statute book. And indeed, political offenses are so various and complex a character, so utterly incapable of being defined and classified, that the task of positive legislation would be impracticable if we're almost absurd to attempt it. Well, that's a lot of old-fashioned language for saying that you don't have to violate a law to be impeached. And um, we expect impeachment to be a political nature. Now, when Story wrote that, there's some irony here, because he thought legislatures would be reasonable, and they would not try to micromanage every single aspect of our lives, and that we wouldn't have uh, tax codes that are millions and millions of pages long, and things like that, so maybe uh, in this context that, that sentiment's a little outdated, but the, the idea that you don't need a crime is actually something that the founding generation would have believed. Now, who's heard of Jerry Ford? Everybody, right? Please, please tell me everybody. Okay. <laughs> what are these people over here? You ever heard of Jerry Ford? Okay. Only president from the United States. He's got a museum on Grand Rapids. Go visit. It's really cool. And at one point, he was um, trying to impeach Associate Justice Douglas. Associate, Doug Associate Justice Douglas was, um, how would I put it? The someone that really didn't care too much what the text of the Constitution said, or its history, or its traditions, and he kept issuing opinions uh, that were, he thought that trees should have standing in a lawsuit. How exactly the trees get to the courthouse and argue their case, I don't know. But, okay, he had some very interesting ideas. And Ford was like, that's it. You know, we, we don't need justices like this. And there were some other things. He thought he was corrupt. There were some questions about a foundation he had and money that was going in for it. And so he, he was going after him. And so people said, well, he hasn't committed a high crime or misdemeanor. And Ford responds, what then is an impeachable offense? The only honest answer is that an impeachable offense is whatever a majority of the House of Representatives considers to be, be at a given moment in history. Conviction results from whatever offense or offenses two-thirds of the other body considers to be sufficiently serious to require removal of the accused from office. Again, the historical context and political climate are important. There are few fixed principles among the handful of precedents. You might say, well, that doesn't sound right. If somebody gets uh, impeached over what the House says is a high crime and misdemeanor, but clearly isn't, then, you know, like, President Trump gives a speech that Nancy Pelosi doesn't like, and she runs off and says, let's impeach him, and they impeach him. That can't be right. The question is, who decides if they're right or not? The Senate's going to try the case, and they may acquit the president. But who says about impeachment? Well, the Supreme Court is going to almost certainly rule that they don't have authority to tell the House of Representatives how to make that decision. They would call that non-judiciable, it's a political question, and they would not enter into that. they say that is reserved for the House. Uh, just like they won't reverse a conviction or an acquittal. Imagine Trump gets acquitted, and then Pelosi appeals to the Supreme Court, and says, well, they made a mistake, the Senate shouldn't have acquitted. The Supreme Court's not gonna touch that case. So the, the raw power politics, Ford nailed it on the head. I'm going to give a very brief overview of the, of the uh, three impeachments that we've had in the past. Andrew Johnson was president of the United States because he was selected by President Lincoln to be his vice president. Andrew Johnson was not a Republican, even though Lincoln was the first Republican president. 
Uh, he picked Johnson because he was from Tennessee and he was a loyalist to the Union. And he was a Democrat. And he felt he was had an election uh, in the middle of the Civil War. He said, if I can get some of these uh, Democrats to vote for me because I'm, I'm showing uh, an olive branch by having my vice president, then, um, you know, Tennessee is in the fighting a war against us, but Johnson is in the U.S. Senate saying that we're wrong and I'm staying with the Union. So he says, I'm going to pick that guy. 45 days later, he's president. 45 days after the election. And he is, unfortunately, a old-fashioned Democrat, which means that he does not approve in, uh, civil rights legislation. He doesn't like uh, the... I mean, I'm not going to say he disliked emancipation, but he certainly didn't like Reconstruction, and he was vetoing the radical Republican Congress's efforts to reinstitute, or actually institute for the first time, racial justice in the South. Uh, they had passed some civil rights laws, the Freedmen Bureaus Act, a whole bunch of things. You remember 40 acres and all that? And he's vetoing all this, and he starts firing, or wants to fire, his cabinet, which were all Lincoln appointees. So Congress says, no, 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 we're not going to let you do that. So they pass an act that says, you have to ask us permission to fire your cabinet members. Probably unconstitutional, but uh, so Johnson fires the Secretary of War, Stanton. And, um, and then Stanton says, you can't fire me. And he goes in and he arrests the new guy that Johnson put into place and takes and puts him in jail. Okay? And it's going back and forth. And the, the Republican Congress says, that's enough. Let's get rid of this guy. Let's impeach him. And so he gets impeached very heavily by a large number in the House of Representatives, goes to the Senate, and the Senate acquits him by one vote. All 11 articles, there's 11 articles of impeachment, and they all deal basically with this Staten affair. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like the Pope and anti-Pope, right? You know, it's like, is he really the Secretary of State? Not really the Secretary of State. But in the end, Congress uh, overrode most of his vetoes and was able to implement Reconstruction. Nixon, uh, excuse me, uh, Bill, yeah, Nixon would be the next. Nixon never had an impeachment, technically, because he uh, resigned on August 9th, 1974. He was charged with um, obstruction of investigating the Water Watergate burglary, misuse of law enforcement intelligence agencies for political purposes, and refusal to comply with the Judiciary Committee subpoenas. The House Judiciary Committee approved those articles. There were Republicans that supported those, those articles. And he was told uh, by some senior advisors, you're going to get impeached and you're going to get removed. You're going to lose in the Senate because it was a Democrat-dominated Senate and the Republicans that were going to likely vote. And so he quit. For the, you know, Nixon, there's a lot of good qualities in Nixon. Most people don't think about the, um, the articles that deal with law enforcement and intelligence agencies, but he literally like sixed the IRS on his political enemies. That alone is probably enough to impeach somebody, um, but he had all these other things about Watergate. If you don't know about Watergate, you need to look it up. <laughs> Bill Clinton, how, who remembers Bill Clinton uh, impeachment? <laughs> that was good theater, right? We all watched it on TV, for those of us that are old enough. And uh, he was, um, for those of you that might not remember. The blue dress. The blue dress. <laughs> so the bottom line is Bill Clinton lied under oath in a civil proceeding about whether or not he had an affair. He perjured himself. There's no question now in the historical record that he perjured himself. He tried to twist the English language in ways that were not twistable. And he was. Um, he tried to cover it up. He tried to, um, you know, the cover up here is so the same thing with Nixon. He tried to cover up. Sometimes the, the cover up is worse than the crime, right? And um, uh, he, he tried to intimidate witnesses and he tried to stop uh, uh, testimony and tried to uh, get witnesses to change their testimony or, or perjure themselves. So he was. What Article 1, for which he was impeached, was willfully corrupting and manipulating the judicial process for the United States for his personal gain and exoneration, willfully committing perjury, providing false and misleading testimony to the grand jury in relation to his relationship with an employee, willfully committing perjury by providing false and misleading testimony to the grand jury in relation to prior perjurious testimony in a civil rights action, 
Uh, allowing his attorney to make false and misleading statements in civil rights action, attempting to influence witness testimony and slow the discovery of evidence in civil rights action. Article 3, for which he was impeached, was uh, this is the Paula Jones case, as opposed to Monica Lewis. He prevented, obstructed, and impeded the administration of justice by encouraging witnesses to give false affidavits and false testimony, etc. Um, he was impeached by the House. There were several Democrats that crossed over and voted with the Republicans went to the Senate, and he was acquitted because they couldn't get the two-thirds vote. So that's the history, um, which I, I'm eager to hear from Professor Dulio to see what, what continues, what's different, um, and the Constitution, and we'll stand for questions when we're both done. Thank you. Okay, so when it comes to questions, remember, we'll do it after yeah. Professor Julio is completed, and you will need to have the microphone. Marianne is going to be wandering around with the microphone, and then we have another one up here so that we'll be able to cover both sides of the room. Actually, there's a third one, so we'll be able to cover the room, but you'll have to wait until after Professor Julio is completed. Professor Julio. How about another round of applause for Judge Warren? Good evening, everybody. Nice to be back at GoGa. Thanks to Teresa, thanks to Marianne for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come to this group. Uh, I enjoy it because you guys always ask good questions, so keep that in mind for when uh, uh, we bring the judge back up and we go through some things. So um, uh, I can actually pick up right where, where the judge left off, and but also maybe go back just a little bit. It, uh, he did a really good job of um, laying out why this is a political rather than a judicial process, right? And we have to remember that. And I don't think we do ourselves any favors uh, by using judicial or court terminology to describe what happens during this, whether it's trial, witnesses, acquittal, right? Those always remind us of um, watching Law and Order on television or something, right? That, that sort of thing. And, and that's not what it is. It is a purely political process. And I agree that uh, the House of Representatives can impeach the president for whatever they want. That's the long and the short of it. And so, so what we're going to do is approach this from a very political perspective now, right? And talk about what the current politics are. But before we do that, I would like to start with what started the whole thing, right? Quid pro quo. I'll do something, you give me something, right? I got a clip for you. Ross, let's just play the clip. How about that? I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to King and uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had they walked out of the press conference and I said, I'm not going to, we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have no authority, you're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the very long we leave it here, and I think it was, what, six hours? I looked at it and said, we're six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a <laughs> got fired. What? Did I play the wrong clip? Well, oh, sorry about that. Um, whoops. Um, I, I thought I'd start with a, a little levity. Serious topic, but a little levity, right? Um, that's uh, former Vice President Joe Biden doing what President Trump is accused of, right? Pretty much, and, and I will say, these circumstances are different. The, it is not an apples to apples comparison. It's a bit of an apples to oranges, but um, I'll leave it to you to decide whether or not that's... Uh... Still a quick pro Okay. Nancy Pelosi's been nervous about this for a long time. And now some Democrats, other, I should say other Democrats, uh, as you know, have been trying to and have been vocal about impeaching the president for years, right? Pretty much since 
election day, right? Um, but Nancy Pelosi is, um, you can disagree with her all you want, she's a pretty good politician, right? She, you don't rise to be Speaker of the House without being a pretty good politician. And I think she saw this. Um, and, and whether or not, uh, let me put it this way, I think that her skepticism about impeachment is reflected in her hesitance to start the process as well as how the process was initiated. If we go back and look at, at the way this impeachment proceeding happened, it was different than the Clinton impeachment process, it was different than the Nixon impeachment process. Uh, when we get into, you might call it arcane, uh, parliamentary procedures of the House of Representatives, what the Judiciary Committee does, how it does it, what it can investigate, et cetera, et cetera. Very different from the previous two impeachments. Uh, and I think that, and I think that, you know, she didn't start it officially until very late in the process with, a, with an actual vote of the House to say, we're actually gonna do this, we're gonna investigate, right? It didn't happen, and I think that that was because of her hesitancy. I also think her hesitancy is, um, on display with how she's approached post-House vote and how she's gonna, and, or, and when she would have a vote to transmit the articles of impeachment to the Senate, right? Which is where we're at right now. Uh, the president was, the vote to impeach was what, 17th, 18th of December, right? We're now on the 14th of January. And the articles still have not been transmitted, which means that the Senate can't do anything. Well, as you know, right, she tried to, she tried to impact the Senate's process, but as, as the judge said, the Senate controls what happens. They get to do it their way, not how the Speaker of the House wants things to happen. But I think that there was a political calculation on her part to try and maybe mitigate some things. And but, but to, tomorrow, she's, her, her hand has been forced, right? Because tomorrow, the vote to transmit the articles is going to take place. We'll find out who the impeachment managers are going to be. The, those are the folks from the House who will go over, and, and I'm going to violate my, what I just said, right? They're sort of the prosecutors, right, that will go to the Senate and make the case. It'll probably be Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler and some others. But we'll see. I think who the, who the impeachment managers are will also... Um, tell us a lot about how the Democrats want to play this. But we can't talk about that because we don't know who they are. Anyway, um, but her he hesitant. And I think we can look at a couple reasons why. And I think one of them is she knows that it's not good for Democrats if President Trump for the rest of the year can say to the American people, hey look, they impeach me, and he'll say they impeach me for nothing, right? He'll say it was, a, that, that, fair, fair enough, right? Whatever. But it's the, what's, what follows up is what's important, which is they impeach me and the Senate acquitted me. Nobody's going to be able to argue with that, right? Because it's not going to happen. As we stand here today, unless something crazy, absolutely crazy happens, the president's not going to be removed. Right? And I think everybody knows that. But I think Nancy Pelosi understands that that's bad for Democrats, De for both congressional candidates and presidential candidates. I also think that there's a, a, a lesson in this here. And, and maybe what, what you might ask, what evidence does Nancy Pelosi have to say that this would be a bad thing for Democrats? Well, here is, um, and I've shown this figure at previous GOGOP uh, presentations. And what you've got is all midterm election outcomes from 2018 back to 1938. And in every one of those except two, the president's party has lost seats in the House of Representatives, right? That's what these bars here mean. Right? This is the seat losses or seat gains, and the House is purple, Senate is yellow, um, and in only two instances has the President's party gained seats in the House of Representatives. Oh, that's a little off. But one of them is 1998. 
the congressional elections right after Bill Clinton was impeached and not removed from office. Right, so that's one of the two exceptions to the rule. The other one, of course, is in 02, post 9-11. A very different political dynamic context, right, from the usual context of midterm elections. But the other one is 98. And if you'll remember, Republicans made the 1998 congressional elections all about impeachment. They tried to nationalize that election, and it backfired. The public wasn't having it. So what ends up happening, right, is when history would tell us that in 1998, Democrats ought to lose a bunch of seats in the House, they don't, because they don't talk about the things that the public wants them to talk about. They talk about impeachment. They talk about Monica Lewinsky in the blue dress. Thank you for that reminder, sir. Um, <laughs> But I think Nancy Pelosi's looking at this going, okay, the last time we had an election right after an impeachment, history changed, right? We didn't follow the historical trends. And that was, I think that they're looking at that going, this might be a bad thing, politically, right? 2018, and here, this is part of that calculation. Democrats won almost every single seat that a Republican held where Hillary Clinton won in 2016, right? So 2016 election happens, Hillary Clinton wins so many X number of congressional districts, right? Wins in those congressional districts. And some of them elect Republicans. 2018 comes along, and I think there were 25 of them. 25 seats in 2018 that Republicans were seeking re-election in that Clinton had won two years before. There you go, 20, yeah, I was right, how about that? Uh, we would call those crossover districts, right? Republicans only defended three of them, and here they are. John Katko, Brian Fitzpatrick, and Will Hurd. Will Hurd is retiring uh, after, this, um, after this term. So of those 25 seats, Democrats won 22 of them. Now, also in 2018, Democrats uh, held 13 districts, they held 13 districts that President Trump won two years before. This creates 31 crossover districts where Democrats won, Democrats hold a seat that President Trump carried that congressional district in 2016. So here are 31 members of the House who are in districts that the president carried now three, and a half, three years ago, right? Those are prime for defeat, many of them. With good candidates, good fundraising, the standard campaign mechanisms, Republicans can win there. And I think the Democrats know it. And they're concerned about it. Now, whether or not those things ha happen, whether good candidates come forward, whether they can raise the money, whether they can craft a good message or not, remains to be seen. But that's the, this is the battleground for control of the Congress, control of the House. A lot more Democratic vulnerabilities in 2020 in the House than Republican vulnerabilities. Because Democrats already beat them all, frankly. So here is uh, the most recent polling on whether or not the public thinks the president ought to be removed from office. And this is telling. And what I've got here for you is, uh, it's from Real Clear Politics. This, if you ask me, this is the best way to look at these polling numbers for a reason I will show you in a minute. What Real Clear, what Real Clear Politics does is take all of the polling data that's out there and they average it, right? So you get this moving average of these of these trend lines, and uh, you can see the public opinion on it has changed dramatically in the last couple of months. Gone from, uh, it's important to note, right, that it never got far, if this might be 
But if, it, if this is 50%, it never got much higher than that, right? It's never been a, a solid majority of the country thinking that this is how we should go. In fact, in the last, well, since the start of the year, and even from probably right around the time of the vote in the House, more Americans have said, no, we shouldn't do this, than have said, yeah, the president should be impeached and removed. So, and it's, you know, fair enough. It's a, it's a, it's a narrow split, right, where right now 47.4% say no, 47.1% say yes. It's a, it's a small margin, but it's in the president's favor, nonetheless, right? So I said that, um, oh, here, and here, this is an even better graph, or one maybe that's one more, that's more important. This gives you, this is from 538. They've got some pretty good polling data. And this splits it by partisanship. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be surprised, right? 83% of Democrats say, yep, impeach him and remove him. You might be surprised that 8% of Republicans think that. But here's the key number. Independence. 43%. Nowhere near a majority of independent voters think that the president should be impeached and removed. That is a significant political finding. Also, that might make some Democrats nervous about proceeding. I said that there were, there were some, uh, that we could take all the polls and look at them. And, and I, I show you this just to give you something to look out for, give you something to pay attention to. Because the polling, to some extent, is all over the place. Or you can find some that are goofy, right? But just, be, just keep your eye out for those, and I'll show you one of these. So this is a little hard to see, but here's a poll. It's from uh, Quinnipiac. And they surveyed uh, 1,500 registered voters, and they came out with, oh, good, nice. Good job, Ross. Wow. He's the man. He's better than the email guy. He's the, I can see it now guy. Zoom in guy. No plus two, right? Among all registered voters. Interestingly, independence, they have a yes plus four. And, and here's another thing to look at, right, is a poll is only as good as its sample, right, which is why the 2016 election, pre-election polls were screwed up. They got the samples wrong. Wait, can you zoom that in again, Ross? Not that one. That's all right. There we go. So here, they tell us the sample. Of those 562 folks, 515 Democrats, 469 Republicans, 422 Independents. That's probably a bit high. The way people vote anyway. Right? That's probably a bit high. I won't quarrel with that too much, but it's a little high. Uh, zoom back out for me. And then we can look at this one. This one's the outlier. This, would be, this is an important one to show. So here, also from Quinnipiac, this, and this, was in, this is about impeach. The other one is about remove, right? So, and it's the same. No, actually, can you zoom back? I want to make sure I'm right on this before I say anything. Uh, eight, eight to twelve. Yeah, it's, it's the same poll. Okay, same sample of people. Look at what the independents say about the process of impeaching, not removing, but impeaching. Plus eighteen. So think about that. When independent voters are asked today, should the president be impeached? They kind of back the the process, right? They back what's been done. 
which is not all that dissimilar from Clinton years. But when they are asked about, you don't have to zoom out, but when they're asked about should he be removed, look how much the opinion changes just of independent voters. 14 point swing. That's significant. And we can look at the other one just, for, just to clean it up. And then you'll see ones like this from YouGov. Again, these are about removal. They have, their independent data shows independents are against it. Is it, I think the best way to look at, don't look at a single poll, right? Look at all of them taken together. That'll take out some of the noise. It'll make it a more robust, more trustworthy finding. So that's my public service announcement about survey research today. Uh, here's, here's a poll from Michigan, it's dated, but he, this is also, I would say, important. And we gotta go back to October for this one, but I, I, I like to show this because it, it breaks it down in, in an important manner. So this was, uh, here we've got, do you support the impeachment inquiry and do you support or oppose impeaching and removing? I've got this highlighted for you because look at how independence in Michigan viewed this months ago. 43% of independents not just opposed it, strongly opposed it. That's important. 34% of independents didn't even want to see the House go on with the process. That's a plurality opinion among independent voters. Again, dated, I'd want to see more recent data, but, but my hunch is that if anything, that number's gone up. Not something you're not going to like. But I don't come here to blow smoke. I'm just going to try to tell you what I, how I see it. We've got a, uh, we had a, a poll come out in the Detroit News uh, last week with a uh, ballot test, the president against the top Democratic contenders. In this poll, he's down seven points to uh, Joe Biden, six to Bloomberg, four to Sanders, two to Warren. But it's, uh, this is pretty recent. I'll, I'll give you two buts. One, I think these, these kinds of polls are tough to look at because it's kind of a one-sided campaign so far. The president doesn't have an opponent. We won't know how things stand until there's a one-on-one -on -one engagement, right? a one-on-one -on -one campaign. But, but think about this, right? Loses to, he's, he's behind against all these folks. But a majority of people in Michigan, not just independent voters, not just um, people, right? Or, or not just independent voters, not just Republicans, but of everybody, a majority opposes impeachment in Michigan right now. This is a curious finding for me. Although it's not terribly surprising because a lot of Americans have very um, inconsistent opinions, right? That's important, if you ask me. When, when, well, yeah, when push comes to shove, what do they do? Right, absolutely. So uh, we're going to move to the Senate. The vote will happen tomorrow. The Senate trial apparently is going to start a week from today. I did it, did it again. I shouldn't use trial because it's not a trial. Here is uh, your favorite New York Senator, Chuck Schumer. He said this on the Senate floor, let the American people hear it loud and clear. The Republican leader said proudly, I'm not an impartial juror. I'm not impartial about this at all. That is an astonishing admission of partisanship. <laughs> that was last week, the week before. Go back, 1998, 1999. Schumer noted that senators had certainly formed previous opinions heading into the trial of Bill Clinton, and noted that the Senate was not, quote, like a jury, but was, quote, not like a jury box. In fact, 
Uh, oh, this continues the quote. In fact, it's also not like a jury box in the sense that people will call us and lobby us. You don't have jurors called and lobbied like in, in things like that. I mean, it's quite different than a jury. And to want to judge Warren point, we jump to Warren's points. We're also the judge. Right? His point about the senators can overrule the chief justice, who's really taking his cues, going to take his cues from the Senate parliamentarian. That person probably really holds the cards in how this will play out. So there's Schumer when it fits him, right? It's a jury, you should be impartial, versus, again, when it fits him, eh, it's not like a jury. But we have to be careful. Here is then RNC Chairman Jim Nicholson. No self-respecting jury would allow somebody who's already formed an opinion on the guilt or innocence of the accused. But Chuck Schumer has loudly proclaimed that he's prejudged the case. He's already announced he's decided the president shouldn't be impeached, much less removed from office. So Republicans have got a little bit of egg on their face too, right? It, it's everywhere. But it's politics. Don't be surprised that that's the case, right? It's politics. And with that, let's bring the judge back up and take your questions. As we mentioned earlier, in order to get a question asked, you need to have the microphone. So we have three going around. We have Marion here, we have Jim is over there, and then we'll get a, a third microphone on this side here. And then we'll go around and make sure we rotate through them. Please make sure your questions are concise. I don't want a reading of the Constitution, War and Peace, we want to get to the point so we can also make sure it shows up well on the cable um, station. So with that, Marianne, you've got the first question here. Thank you. We have Susie Corker here. I'm going to learn to turn my mic on. There we go. <laughs> I, listening to the radio this morning, uh, they were talking about Nancy Pelosi was going to deliver the uh, uh, impeachment, articles of impeachment. And then she, they also said that at the time that Trump was already or, or was uh, getting together with his panel of attorneys, and I just wondered who pays for the attorneys. <laughs> who do you think? <laughs> that's a that's a great question. Um, I know that there's been some discussion about the president having personal attorneys, and. Um, being that he's not an indigent defendant, I would assume that he would be paying for his own personal attorney fees. The managers um, that are coming over from the House, they are um, paid by the taxpayers because they're representatives. They have legal counsel that helps them at the House of Representatives, they're staff members, and they would be paid by the taxpayers. The, on the Senate side, um, in addition to any personal attorneys the president might employ, any of their staff members are also gonna be um, paid by the taxpayers. So it, it'll be a mix. I don't think there's a, I think Bill Clinton actually had a fund, didn't he, that, that, that was to raise money, because remember, he wasn't rich, and, and they had some fund where they poured in money to hire, the, to pay for the lawyers, the legal defense fund. And so I think he had that for Whitewater and for Monica and for you know all that stuff. They they had legal defense funds. So, Professor, you have anything to add? No. All right, so Jim, do you have a question? Is there? No. No questions. No questions. No. No questions. No questions Marion, you got another one? Oh, I got lots of them. Over here. She doesn't need a microphone. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you need to put that videotaping. You need to in view of some of these impeachment hearings before the uh, Intelligence Committee in the House first and then the Judiciary Committee, you were hearing what uh, Pencil Neck Schiff wanted you to hear or what uh, Jerry Nadler wanted you to hear. You weren't having a balanced presentation. How much do you think 
that influence what you are seeing in the polling regarding impeach or not, remove or not? And how much do you think it's going to turn if they televise the Senate stuff and you have a presentation from the other side? So for the benefit of the viewing public, uh, how much did, he, let me, tell me if I'm not getting your question right, Joanne. Um, how much did the process in the House, in the Intelligence Committee, in the Judiciary Committee impact public opinion about proceedings? Right. Some. And I say that because not a lot of people paid attention. I think that this is, I think people are focused on other things. I, I think, and you know, I, there's, people have formed opinions and they are using the information that is available to them. And Republicans have said that they believe the process in the House was not fair, that it was one-sided. Um, you know, y'all can look at the witness lists and, and see who testified, who didn't, and make up your mind about that. Now we move to the Senate, and the partisan control is switched, right? Why were certain people allowed and certain people not allowed in the Intel and Judiciary Committees? because Democrats have the gavel. Now who's in charge, right? It would be a different story. And you're hearing now calls for witnesses in the Senate, right? You've heard that for, for a while. Well, Democrats, they might be careful what you wish for, right? Because Republicans can call witnesses now, and I don't think they would call the same ones. <laughs> that answer your question? All right, so Jim, you've got a question. Uh, just a quick question. Pelosi keeps talking about if this impeachment doesn't work, they will impeach again and again and again. Is that legal? So the, the question is, is it uh, constitutional? And double jeopardy is in the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. It's been incorporated against the states in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. But that is criminal charges that there's a trial and someone is acquitted. For example, in my court, if somebody is tried for murder and they're acquitted, and the next day they find that DNA evidence that links the defendant to the crime and it would have made a difference, too bad. You try the case, it's over. Impeachment is political, and I, there is nothing in the Constitution, as far as I can tell. Um, I mean, I read you all the provisions that deal with, it doesn't say you get impeachment once and you're done. So they, I think they certainly can make, that they choose to make the political calculation to impeach, you know, they, let's go back. First they were going to impeach him about Russia. Then they were going to impeach him for obstruction of the Mueller report. Then there were, there were I mean, how many, there's like five or other, six other theories that they kept floating and finally they latched on to the Ukraine one. So if that one fails, that doesn't mean that he's off scot-free for the rest of the thing. They, they, could, they could keep going and going and going, absolutely. <laughs> Do you disagree with that? Nope. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, we're going to go now. I'll be here. Uh, John. Yeah, do you think that, do you think that uh, the specific accusation, well, how will they word that, do you think? That, I mean, high crime and the misdemeanor, okay, they can't just say, we accuse you of that, they're going to have to say, we accuse you of this. Well, they already have, right? And I think Judge Warren is looking for the exact language. But one of them was obstruction of Congress, right? Um, abuse of power. Oh, abuse of power, yes. So, so those, that's the specific charge. You're right, you're right both times. The first is abuse of power. The second one is obstruction of Congress. The abuse of power, if you read it, it's all about the, the allegations that refer about that he used his office to extract a, an attempt to extract a political favor from Ukraine to attack his, his political domestic opponents. And obstruction of Congress is his instructing um, members of his administration not to appear before Congress and not to um, honor the subpoenas that were issued against them. So that, 
I, I would read it, but they're really long and they're really tedious and boring. But but that that's that those are the those are the allegations. Okay, we're going over here. So in this impeachment, we've got a obstruction of Congress is one of the charges. One of the previous impeachments, there was an obstruction of a Judiciary Committee, I believe. Um, if I heard you properly, I mean, what are those both be on rather shaky constitutional grounds, and and that we have separate equal branches of government? So the, the other was obstruction of the judicial process. That was um, Clinton obstructed judicial proceedings by trying to suborn perjury and false affidavits and other things, okay, in a civil, in a couple different court proceedings that were, that had nothing to do with Congress. And then um, Nixon impeded the investigation into Watergate. And that did involve Congress. So some was Congress, and some, in fact, there was a, there was a case that um, he asserted executive privilege and tried to say that his uh, administrators did not need to appear, and the Supreme Court, for, uh, on a subpoena, the Supreme Court said no, no, no one's above the law, you have to appear. So there is, there are great separation of powers issues there. Do you want to look at the separation of powers issues? Uh, no, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would simply say that I think that there's a, a normal course of action for this, right? Which is Congress requests information, Congress subpoenas information. This, let's just be honest about it. This is not the first time the White House has said, we're not giving it to you. Sorry. Right? I mean, that happens all the time. Uh, maybe not with subpoenas, but the normal process would be Congress says, give us this. The White House says, no. Democrats take it to court, and a, and a court irons it out. Right? We didn't get that far in this. Is that more or less the case? The, the, the Democrat, now remember, there, it's very interesting because initially there was this great sense of urgency that we needed to move forward with impeachment immediately because there was a grave threat to the republic. And therefore, when the administrator, administration officials were not appearing, they could have run to court. In fact, some of the officials ran to court and they said, I will appear and testify if the court tells me I should, but I won't if, unless you order me to. And they, the Democrats, um, it was very partisan, so that's what it was. The, the Democrats basically said, never mind, and made moot those cases. Then, of course, Pelosi has been holding on to them since this, So there was a sense of urgency which has now dissipated. I, I don't really, I know how to square all that, but that, that's what happened. But the, um, we didn't have case, we did have cases here, but they all vanished because the Democrats did not pursue the subpoenas in court. That's what happened. Okay, we're going to go here to Jay. Bill? Okay, I'd like to hear some comments on the media whose reporting has been extremely biased. How have they influenced or not influenced the polling and the process? People get information from various sources, right? And I, and I think that um, we, we live in a, in a media world today where it's segmented and people pick and choose, right? I think that Democrats know how they feel, Republicans know how they feel, and, and a lot of folks in the middle are like, eh. So, you know, how, how much of an impact, again, I'd say marginal. Yeah, um, I would say is, uh, as biased as it has been, and as dominant as the bias has been, it seems like they haven't influenced it at all. Or very little. I'd say marginal. Yeah, because I, I, I think people are, people know where they stand on this, right? I mean, I, it, you're not, could we say anything here tonight that would change anybody's mind? <laughs> go, to the, go to the Rochester Democratic Club that's probably meeting somewhere, ask them the same thing, and they would say no, right? I mean, opinions are firm. And it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that, you know, we're a, we're a split nation, 50-50, whatever you want to call it, polarized, whatever you want to say. This follows the same 
basic breakdown, 50-50. I, I, I got one more question. This is a little more about the law. What offices are impeachable, since we're talking about this, and who else and how many besides the president have been impeached? So there have been, um, I heard a figure the other day of 17 to 19, I think it's fine. You don't have to apologize for moving my glass. Uh, 17, I think, they said 17, but I don't know if that included the presidential impeachments. And all the other impeachments have been judges, actually. So federal judges are susceptible to impeachment. They have life tenure. There's this thing called black robe disease. So they, you know, they, they feel like they can do whatever, right? And then they're corrupt, um, and they get caught and they get impeached. But technically, any public, federal public official is subject to impeachment and removal from office. So then the question becomes, what's an office holder? But you could definitely cabinet members, uh, probably um, people that we might not consider to be in civil service, but like our political appointees, probably ambassadors and diplomats. All those people are likely to be subject to impeachment, but it's, it's just been the judges who have been targeted so far. I was just wondering, uh, if, let's say Biden won the president vote. Okay, he's our president. Can he get impeached for all that he's done with Iran and the money and... Uh, if a majority of the House of Representatives chooses to impeach him, okay. I would answer you with another question. How many votes do Republicans have in the House? Because <laughs> that's, that, that, that's, what, that's what we've decided, right? If they've got the votes, they, they can, the House of Representatives can do whatever it wants with 218 votes. Even years after? I mean, they can impeach him for whatever they want. Okay, next, Chuck, you've got a next question. My, uh, well, just on just, just a, a follow-up on that, Justice Kavanaugh, you know, was accused of doing some egregious things in high school. And there were some Democrat representatives that said, okay, he got through, fine, let's impeach him. It's not for anything he did as a judge, it's not for anything he did as a Supreme Court justice, it's for what he allegedly did as a high schooler. And so, as the professor just said, whatever they want, it's free game. Mine goes to polling and where, where we might be going. You like the sort of the all, all average type of thing. I look at some of those averages as being sort of heavily weighted in de for the Democrats. They had more people being sampled as Democrats than Republicans. It doesn't necessarily um, reflect the middle of the country. There's a lot of that polling that's going on, you know, on the East and West Coast. Here in Michigan, we had we have about 5,000 precincts. Trump won by 10,000 votes, which is, if you average that out, it would be two votes per precinct. Some of the polls are saying the blacks are moving towards towards Trump. Yeah, 30. I've seen 38, 39. But you know, where's that coming from? And what are we going what are we going to need to do to get more than two votes per precinct to put our president over in Michigan? And you know, talk about it as polls. My favorite poll is probably Bresmo's. And it's just he's got a good track record as opposed as to you know the average you're talking about. As I said, polls are only as good as their sample, right? And and polls are wrong when they're trying to predict things if they for elections if the pollster doesn't guess the sample right doesn't so what the pollster has to do is figure out okay this is what voter turnout is going to look like on election day and they got to match their sample to that if their sample matches voter turnout in terms of partisan identification uh, age education race ethnicity uh, income level they'll get it right this question. So, so most polls have more Democrats in their sample because there's more Democrats in this country. You might not want to hear that, but that's true. 
right? There are more Democrats than Republicans, generally speaking. On election day, if Republicans can, can turn their voters out, and this answers, this really gets to the last part of your question, right? If Republicans can turn their voters out, they can get to parity in terms of party ID of the electorate, of people who show up at the polls. That's what matters, right? Uh, President Trump can win Michigan if Republicans turn out. It is about, for Republicans, it's gonna be about identifying voters, identifying supporters, and turning them out at the polls, period. Because there are some warning signs. Not with the polls, but with data, right? With, with other data, with voter turnout from last time. The president wins by 11,000 votes, right? Statewide. Hillary Clinton got, she underperformed Barack Obama in Wayne County alone by 80,000. That's voter turnout, right? Democrats are gonna be good at it. They've always been good at it. They're gonna be good at it. That's, that's a number to keep an eye on. Okay, Robbie Defer. This is for both the judge and the professor. Has there been anything in history prior to this election in 2016 where from the get-go, the Democrats hated Trump's election and has done everything from the Mueller investigation through this impeachment process to do nothing but distract the public citizens from what accomplishments this president has been doing. And this hate continues to go on. So I question, therefore, is the impeachment an instrument for this tirade? It's the same as the Mueller thing. And that's what I'm wondering from both of you. All right, so there, there are two questions there. First is, this ever happened before in history? History's a long time, but I would say <laughs> that John Quincy Adams beat Andrew Jackson by uh, very similar to what Trump did. He, he won the Electoral College but lost the popular vote. And as soon as he was elected, as soon as he took office, the knives were out for John Quincy Adams because they said that it, you know, they, they threw every epithet that maybe he has some of the specific. So th this is not, a, I don't think this is uncommon. And the fact that the losing party hates the other party, is president, and tries to obstruct and point everything out, and I don't think that's unusual. I think maybe the, 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 the quantity, the severity. the severity, exponentially, you know, it's higher, but I, I, I think that's standard operating procedure. Um, and again, the issue of is impeachment a, a political tool? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. It's, that, that's what Hamilton warned about. Now, I will say this. We've only had three impeachments in the past. So it has been a very rarely used political tool. And usually there's extraordinary circumstances that provoke that. And I will leave for history to decide whether or not this is one of those extraordinary circumstances or not, because we're still in the middle of it. The only thing I would add to that is, is I, I think we've seen in recent years, in recent history, some processes, some institutions have been used as tools. Or, and, and they're, they're or, or precedents, uh, norms, traditions have been disrespected, right? And I think, I would point you to um, the filibuster in the Senate, right? And for, for years and years and years, uh, senators could filibuster judicial nominees, and they stopped some of them from getting through. And in 2013, Harry Reid, Democratic majority leader, in the Senate from Nevada had had enough of it, and he said, all right, we're changing the rules to not a lot so we can get our judges through, right? Well, he's thinking again about that now because President Trump has nominated and the Republican Senate has put through a record number of judicial nominees, right? But 
my concern is that we do this with impeachment, right? Where it becomes a, well, you screwed our guy, so we're going to get you kind of thing, right? And it, it's this tit for tat back and forth. And that's, that's bad for the, const I would say, for the Constitution. That's bad for our institutions. And that's bad. I think it's bad for the country. We're going to take our last two questions. So we've got one over here. Oh, hi. Um, my question is pertaining to the young people. I'm talking about even elementary, high school, you know, colleges, universities. I'm a school bus driver, and I find this a lot where the kids are influenced by their teachers, but yet their families don't agree with the way that the teachers think. I I I thought that you you know you had to keep that separate. And I wanted to know your opinion on that. Can teachers do that to their children in their classrooms? Uh, I'll just I'll we started a new semester last week at Oakland University. I'll tell you what I told my intro to American politics students. I told them that my politics don't matter. Yours do. Uh, I told them that I would never give them my opinion about whether President Trump is the greatest thing since sliced bread or the worst thing in history. Right? I said, I will never do that. Um, and I think it stinks when other people do. Um, yeah, I just want to touch on this. So I'm a former member of the State Board of Education. And I was also a board member at Cornerstone Schools for many years. And um, just, just some high-level comments on this. Um, we have done a remarkably terrible job in teaching our students about the Constitution and about American history. And the general perspective in education, and there's lots of exceptions to this, and there's lots of teachers, and shining lights. And the general thing is that um, blame America first. We sh we're ashamed of our history because we were flawed at its beginning, and we, we have to uh, self-flagellate ourselves and, and, um, and never be proud of anything that America does. And I'll give you an example. For part of Patriot Week, we had a, uh, what we call Constitution Day, we had about 350 students come in and um, we give an overview of the Constitution, we uh, have a little mock trial um, and a college bowl with a guy dressed up like James Madison running around. And part of the opening, I say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to establish new government, laying its foundation such principles, and organizing its power such forms as events will seem most likely to affect for safety and happiness. Those words from the Declaration of Independence were revolutionary in 1776, and they remain revolutionary today. And then I spend a little bit of time talking about how blessed we are to live in the country. Okay? A few weeks later, I get a packet of letters from the International Academy in Troy, who was there. High school student, um, government class. And there's a cover letter. And the teacher says, Judge Warren, thank you so much for inviting us to the Constitution Day. We had such a marvelous time. Uh, we really enjoyed it. But uh, your, this visit provoked much controversy and discussion amongst our students. And I encourage them to write you letters. To, so that we could maybe perhaps continue this conversation. I said, well, this is kind of interesting. So there's all these, there's like 10 handwritten letters. So the first one I start reading, I said, Judge Moore, thank you so much for inviting us to come in. And by the way, you're trying to brainwash the students. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Moore, next letter. Judge Moore, thank you so much for inviting us. I really enjoyed the mock trial. And by the way, don't you know that America is a flawed, terrible history? And how can you possibly say such nice things about the country? Third letter, Judge Moore, you mentioned 
And I was appalled because right next to me was a Muslim student, and you said that Islamic terrorists had attacked the Twin Towers. I'm sorry, that's what happened. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? And so I had 10 of these. That's okay. So the answer is it's terrible that teachers do that. They shouldn't do that. The parents need to intervene and complain to the administrators and all that stuff. But you know, I've been on the K through 12 Social Studies Standards Committee. Uh, it, it's a loot. It's it's a. I'm not going to say it's a lost fight, but it's it's a real struggle, which is why we have to do things outside of the regular schools. Which is why things like Patriot Week, where we renew the spirit of America, um, at, for everyone, for people that have graduated from high school that are past that stage, people your age and little kids in elementary school. We have to take it on ourselves because we cannot, if we rely on the education community, the current one that's in control, it's over. Yeah. It's over. We have to step up to make a difference. Oh, last question. Last question. <laughs> uh, my thing is this the impeachment process in general. And, and it, I've been through two now. So is there a clip? Now I was a little younger, but I followed it. And I didn't necessarily like the process that it's very political. And I think this is very political. My thing is, I'm looking at this and saying, look, as elected officials, you go in there, you should look. History tells you neither side wins when you impeach on this very vague crimes and misdemeanors. I think nobody would doubt it if we feel there are treason or bribery and but stuff like this, you know, Clinton was something he said in a trial that had nothing to do with his presidency, you know. And I wonder, it seems to me, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've looked, polls for everything. In other words, confidence in the president, confidence in Congress started going down and has continued to go down. It's very low, right? You know, people don't really support Congress and stuff. Ever since we kind of started this process, we've turned this in. I think it's a lesson for those of us getting elected to office, that this tool should only be used in really extreme cases. I don't know if you, your opinion kind of shows that or if you've ever looked at that. I, I don't have data at the top of my head to share with you, but my general sense is that you're right. That, you know, I, I think trust and confidence, approval rating of institutions um, has gone down over the last 60, 70 years. But I think that it, there, there was a bit more of a cliff in the mid-90s. And that's uh, back in the time of Speaker Gingrich, uh, Bill Clinton, right, when they had their, their many tussles, right? It, the, the Watergate scandal had a lot of, um, ate away at a lot of trust and confidence in the presidency, for sure. Um, and I think that you know you can look back at things like um, the uh, advent of cable news, and we get into this media environment that is splintered, that is uh, you know uh, factionalized to some degree, uh, and then you know we're, it's, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it, it's probably too early to know this empirically, but social media is going to have a big impact on it too. I mean, it's going to just it's going to go, I mean, it's a cesspool. Um, uh, Twitter's awful, right? I mean, it, it's awful. Um, and, and I think that, I think that's dangerous as well, right? I mean, it, when, when Americans can't talk to each other in a way that is respectful, we're hoaxed, right? I mean, it's a bad thing. So, the, and, and, the, the, uh, and, and Judge Warren began with a commercial, I'll end with one. Um, thank you for the plug of the, for the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. We do try to do things in a way that brings all different perspectives uh, about all different kinds of issues. We're going to do something um, in two weeks uh, on an issue of uh, human trafficking, myths and realities. You wouldn't. I, I met a woman who runs a, a nonprofit uh, organization in Oakland County called Sanctum House that helps victims of human trafficking. I thought. Uh, naively that human trafficking was people coming across borders, right, and international borders, and it's, it's not. It's down the street, and it's, it's, it's crushing, right, to, to hear about these things. But Senator Ruth Johnson, 
is going to be there. Uh, uh, Representative Christine Grieg from the State House is going to be there. Uh, we'll have somebody from Homeland Security talk about the law enforcement perspective. We'll have a survivor. We'll have uh, somebody from uh, Sanctum House. We'll have somebody, uh, we'll have a physician to talk about the health aspect of it. So it's not, thank you for trying to say it's partisan, it's nonpartisan, bipartisan, but it's really about different perspectives on all sorts of things that we try to uh, bring to light. So if you're interested, more than happy to tell you about it and get you information. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, round of applause for both of us.